Hey all, welcome back to the Real Life Pharmacology Podcast. I am your host, Eric Christensen, pharmacist. I appreciate you taking the time to listen today. Uh, today is uh, we're going to talk about acetylcholinesterase inhibitors more specifically. Uh, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitor I see used in practice most, uh, which is Dinepazil. Well, the brand name for that medication is Aricept, and it is uh, utilized in the management of uh, dementia, mostly Alzheimer's dementia, uh, with a, a few exceptions there. So uh, getting into the mechanism of action, uh, so in, in dementia and Alzheimer's dementia specifically, uh, there is uh, what researchers have found is that there's low cholinergic activity, and this activity through acetylcholine and other uh, mediators um, is reduced, and it's obviously very important for memory, memory recall, and things of, of that nature. So that uh, reduced activity obviously what the drug is going to target is try to uh, preserve those molecules in the brain, which hopefully helps patients symptomatically. Okay, two very, very important points with this mechanism of action. So it does not stop dementia and it does not reverse dementia. So those are two very, very important things that uh, patients, caregivers, must understand the progression of dementia is going to continue on. They're going to continue to get worse. The goal, the hope of the medication is that it helps somewhat with symptoms, maybe a little bit of memory recall, um, but they are going to continue uh, to get worse over time. So that's very important to remember that these are not a cure for dementia and patients need to be and caregivers need to be educated about that. So kind of wrapping up uh, this mechanism of action. So acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, they inhibit the enzyme that breaks down acetylcholine. So it helps preserve more acetylcholine uh, in the brain. And that hopefully, again, improves a little bit of memory and, and potentially functioning there. So that's how the, the drug works overall. But again, doesn't stop dementia, doesn't reverse dementia. Now, there is a, a few important points with dosing. Uh, typical starting dose uh, for denepazil is about 5 milligrams. And um, maybe after 4 weeks, 6 weeks, somewhere in there, maybe about a month, uh, we can increase that dose uh, up to 10 milligrams. Now, I have seen doses uh, up to 20 milligrams, and there is a 23 milligram dosage form. Uh, at least at this time, it's really expensive, much more expensive uh, than doing the generic uh, 5 to, to 10 milligram dosing there. So, uh, you know, do you get much more bang for your buck? Uh, honestly, I... I would say you you definitely see more adverse effects. Um, you know how much more benefit and is it worth it? That's always a clinical risk versus benefit type assessment that you want to discuss with uh, patients, caregivers, and really try to identify what the exact goals of therapy are with these agents. So. I mentioned those adverse effects, particularly as you start escalating doses. And with acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, uh, GI upset, nausea, and diarrhea. That is by far uh, the most common adverse effects you're going to see uh, with denepazil. And because of this, uh, we usually dose this medication at night which is kind of unique because a certain percentage of patients will actually get insomnia from this medication. Okay, It's, it's fairly low. I think it's less than 10% if I recall right. Uh, don't quote me on that percentage, but I definitely uh, have seen it happen in practice. So in that situation, in geriatrics, we run into the problem so many times of polypharmacy and so let's say in the prescribing cascade, so let's say we start denepazil and we're dosing it at night. Now all of a sudden they aren't sleeping, so we add, you know, another 
poor medication, zolpidem or uh, diphenhydramine uh, meds that aren't tolerated very well in the elderly, and so on and so forth. They they cause other side effects and that type of thing. So it's it's really important to um, pay attention to when we're starting drugs, increasing drugs, and make sure they're not adding to some of those uh, side effects. So uh, GI upset, nausea, diarrhea, definitely most common. Uh, insomnia can happen. With those GI adverse effects, I did want to mention about the potential for weight loss. Uh, this can often be challenging in dementia because many de- dementia patients are at risk for weight loss. Uh, due to those cognition issues, uh, swallowing issues can happen as well. So sometimes weight loss is challenging to tell whether it's dementia versus the medication. But you have got to remember to look at the acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, look at denepazil, uh, if you do have a patient that has been losing weight. It definitely can contribute to weight loss. And again, primarily because of those GI side effects. Uh, now, rarely... Uh, bradycardia is a possibility with uh, denepazil. So if you think about, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in, in drug interactions and some of those meds, but if you think about other drugs that might lower the pulse or lower the heart rate, um, we could potentially you know, worsen that or drop that heart rate further with the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Not real strong of an effect, uh, you know, it's not like a, a, a beta blocker, for example. Um, but if you've got somebody that's kind of already borderline low, it could drop it a little bit further. So something to definitely uh, pay attention to. Uh, other, you know, kind of wacky, unique side effects. I, I have seen uh, psych changes, you know, where maybe patients will be actually more confused. Maybe they'll hallucinate. Um Maybe they'll have more anxiety. So you, you may see some, some wacky things like that. And you know I think a, a good thing to think about is any drug that works in the brain uh, probably has the potential uh, to cause various types of CNS side effects. Um, that's kind of a vague generality, but I, th- I think it definitely holds true when you start talking about um, the complexity of the brain and using drugs uh, that target the brain. Uh, one other one I'll throw out there, um, urinary incontinence and frequency, it, it may contribute or exacerbate that. And the way I, I really think about uh, at least some of these adverse effects is the adverse effects are going to be opposite of the effects of anticholinergic medications. So let's take that last one, urinary frequency, incontinence. Well, we use anticholinergics to sometimes treat those side effects. So there's there's a good example of opposing effects. Another example, atropine, which is used in uh, acute management of bradycardia. So it can stimulate that heart rate in bradycardia. Whereas the acetylcholinesterase, again, opposite effects, it might drop that heart rate some. Uh, uh, another adverse effect, diarrhea. Um, constipation happens with anticholinergics. With the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, diarrhea is much more prevalent and common. So you can kind of see those opposing effects, and that's really uh, ties into the, the mechanism of action there. So let's take a quick break, uh, and then I'll, I'll elaborate a little bit more on, on some of the really important drug interactions. Um, but we'll take a quick break from our, our sponsor here. We've been getting a little help on our NAPLEX content lately. We're trying to really uh, beef that up to support students and new new graduates who are uh, looking to take their NAPLEX exam. Uh, Also got plenty of other resources for for pharmacists, for, uh, you know, nurse practitioners, clinical guidance, clinical um, books as far as medication management goes. Uh, Definitely go support our sponsor. Uh, Check out those resources at meded101.com slash store. You can find links to different Audible books, different hard copy books, uh, as well as some uh, online resources as well. So that's meded101.com slash store, S-T-O-R-E. Looking at drug interactions here, uh, by far uh, the biggest drug interaction I think about with acetylcholinesterase inhibitors are drugs that have anticholinergic effects. And, you know, I I always think about the ones that are highly anticholinergics. So we're talking about 
uh, tricyclic antidepressants. So we've got nortriptyline, amitriptyline. Uh, think about some of the older generation uh, antihistamines. So you've got hydroxazine, you've got diphenhydramine. Those types of drugs that have anticholinergic effects, uh, oxybutynin is another one that just came into my head. Um, but those types of drugs that have centrally acting uh, systemic anticholinergic effects can block or blunt the response to the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Okay, These drugs oppose each other uh, with the way their mechanism works. So always, always think of, do I have it, my patient who has dementia, who has memory problems, are they on anticholinergic medications already before you're even going to consider adding another medication for dementia? Because there definitely is the possibility that let's say a patient's taking uh, over-the-counter diphenhydramine for sleep, there definitely is the possibility that that is contributing to their uh, confusion and maybe mental cloudiness. So definitely think about that uh, before a patient uh, is diagnosed with Alzheimer's dementia and placed on uh, medication therapy because the drugs uh, will oppose uh, one another there. Uh, so that's definitely the, the biggest one I think of when I think of denepazil and the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, another one, you know, I, I mentioned the adverse effect of bradycardia. So I am paying close attention, particularly in patients who have maybe a lower resting heart rate to begin with, or and or they're on drugs that drop pulse, which many Elderly patients are on drugs like beta blockers, uh, drugs like cert, uh, certain calcium channel blockers, the dil diltiazem, the verapamils. So those are, are good examples of meds that can drop the pulse rate. And if we add on acetylcholinesterase inhibitor, it could um, maybe exacerbate that, maybe make somebody who's borderline uh, drop them a little bit further. So again, pretty rare, but something definitely uh, to think about. So those are the two big things that I think about with drug interactions. Uh, we're going to wrap up the, the podcast for today. Uh, go snag your free resource at reallifepharmacology.com. Uh, it's over a 31-page PDF on the top 200 drugs where I highlight really, really important stuff that you're likely to be tested on at some point uh, throughout your pharmacy, medical um, career if you have to take a, a pharmacology class. So really cool resource there. Go get that for free simply for um, following the, the podcast there. Uh, leave us a rating review on iTunes. Greatly, greatly appreciated uh, to those who have already done so, but certainly that helps us um, get in front of a bigger audience and lets uh, more individuals learn and understand uh, medications at a better and higher level. I'm going to sign off for today. Thank you guys so much for listening. Um, it's been an unbelievable uh, first year here, and I, I can't thank you enough for all the support. Take care, guys. Have a great rest of your day.